Good afternoon and welcome to the Betsy and Walter Stern <coughs> Conference Center here at Hudson Institute. <coughs> My name is Ken Weinstein. I'm president and CEO of Hudson Institute. Our mission at Hudson is to promote American leadership and global engagement for a secure, free, and prosperous future. And key to our mission is assuring U.S. technological leadership. Our founder, Herman Kahn, the the great futurist and strategist saw the uh, interaction between strategy, technology, and demography as critical to shaping the future, as critical to shaping the global policy landscape, uh, often in ways that more conventional and nearsighted policy analysts couldn't imagine. <clears throat> and uh, U.S. technological leadership, as I mentioned, is core to our mission. It's also core to America's ability, more importantly, to stay ahead of strategic competitors and rogue threats. We at Hudson do a significant amount of work on defense policy, on information technology, intellectual property, uh, IP, and have key initiatives on defense technology cooperation, biodefense, quantum computing, missile defense. In all these areas, American leadership is critical. Now, our work on space dates back to uh, the days of our founder, Herman Kahn, in the early 1960s. Uh, more recently, our work in the defense sector has included uh, some of the earliest work uh, in the United States on China's then burgeoning attempts at uh, uh, seeking space dominance more than a decade ago, and more recent work on space-based missile defense. The initiative that brings us together today is uh, our work is called Space 2.0. It's directed by my colleague Brant Pasco, and it's an important initiative that again recognizes the critical importance of maintaining U.S. leadership in space at a time of profound transfer, transformation and growth in the industry and in its allied fields in the face of global competition. And key to maintaining this leadership is a reevaluation of the U.S. global and legal landscapes governing space. We kicked off this uh, event series and this program in May was an event featuring the Executive Secretary of the National Space Council, Dr. Scott Pace. And um, we're here today with uh, two extraordinary public servants and a, a panel of leading experts to continue this, uh, this series. Um, as I think all of us know, uh, to meet the challenge of maintaining U.S. Uh, leadership in space, which is a priority for President Trump, uh, the President has entrusted Vice President Pence, a good friend of Hudson Institute, as chairman of the National Space Council to work with Congress and the executive branch to reshape the legal environment for the commercial use of outer space. And today we really have an extraordinary opportunity, as I mentioned, to hear from two of the individuals leading the charge uh, for reform in this area. The chair of the House Science and Space and Technology Committee, Representative Lamar Smith, as well as the cabinet secretary who's been entrusted with taking the lead on space issues, Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross. Secretary of Commerce Ross will engage in a dialogue with my colleague Brant Pasco shortly after uh, Chairman Smith offers a keynote remark. And uh, all of these comments will be followed by a brief coffee break, and then uh, we'll have a panel discussion of senior government officials, all from the Department of Commerce, <coughs> responsible for executing the reform agenda laid out by the Trump administration. So. Uh, let's get underway. I want to offer heartfelt thanks to our Space 2.0 Advisory Board, Joe Pelton, Pierre DeFries, Dale Hatfield, uh, Rob McDowell, and others for the significant time they put into this effort, as well as Hudson Trustee uh, Dr. Margaret Whitehead, who has been really spearheading this effort uh, to get us moving here. Now I have uh, the distinct honor of introducing an extraordinary public servant, uh, Congressman Lamar Smith, the chairman, as I mentioned, of the House Space Science, Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Chairman Smith is an extraordinary public servant. He's been in Congress for more than three decades and has had a long and has a long and distinguished record on critical policy issues as the former chairman of the House Judiciary Committee uh, and also uh, known for his leadership as chairman of the House Ethics Committee. As uh, chairman of the space of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, Chairman Smith has jurisdiction over budgets totaling more than $42 billion, programs at NASA, the Department of Energy, EPA, the National Science Foundation, the FAA, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, essentially most of the programs that are critical to national uh, research and development and also critical to uh, scientific discovery 
space exploration and new technologies. Sorry to say that this will be his last term in Congress, and uh, as he completes his third term as uh, chairman of the committee, uh, he's, um, his, uh, the distinctions are far too many to mention, but let me simply note that in 2011, uh, he was named Policymaker of the Year by Politico for his work on patent reform legislation. And uh, without any further ado, let's give a warm Hudson Institute uh, welcome to Chairman Lamar Smith. Ken, thank you. Ken, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for making the Science Committee jurisdiction sound so good. And uh, appreciate being with you all here today. And I know Secretary Ross is going to be with us in just a few minutes, too. And it's nice to sort of uh, coordinate with him and be talking about some of the same subjects today as well. I want to thank you for letting me um, speak a little later than originally uh, advertised. I was chairing a full committee hearing until about 15 minutes ago and got here as, as quickly as I could. Uh, by the way, even that hearing had to do a little bit with space because it's the first hearing ever held on the subject of urban, what is it, uh, urban area mobility vehicles, otherwise known as flying cars. And so we had wonderful witnesses to talk about the flying cars. And for the first time ever, I actually presented all members of the committee and all five witnesses with a uh, present, which was a model flying car uh, that I saw for the first time when I was walking around the mall several weeks ago. And I was just spellbound. I've been keeping, why am I talking about this? I'm supposed to be talking about space. Anyway, I was spellbound because I've been fascinated by flying cars. I have a I've had articles, I've been collecting articles since I was in elementary school. So when I see my first flying car, I stopped, ordered one immediately, uh, flew it several weeks ago in Lincoln Park, not far from the Capitol. It performed admirably. And so uh, I knew it wasn't just pie in the sky, it was a real thing. So that's why I passed them out today. So anyway, so space one way or the other, whether it's flying cars or whether it's talking about what's gonna be up there in the coming uh, years. Uh, also, um, I usually don't read prepared remarks. I am today and I'm, uh, reminded of what William F. Buckley once said, and that is that one should pay the audience the ultimate compliment of preparing remarks for delivery. So that's what I've tried to do today. A generation ago, space was largely an unexplored frontier. Few would have imagined a world of reusable private space rockets, global communications and remote sensing, private space stations, celestial resource prospecting, or on-orbit manufacturing. A highly dynamic international security environment has changed space from a sanctuary to a congested and contested domain. At the same time, the private sector is opening up new frontiers and taking an increasingly important role in outer space. New technologies and novel strategies are lowering the cost of access to space. The standardization of space technologies and satellite platforms enable a robust human presence in the sky above us. New entrants such as SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Virgin Galactic, along with companies with a long heritage like Lockheed and Boeing, are investing significant capital in space exploration. Private equity is funding a new era of innovation that is changing the economies of space activities. With this evolution, of course, comes new challenges. The Outer Space Treaty was developed in 1967 to establish a framework for international space law. Among other provisions, the Outer Space Treaty requires national governments to be responsible for all space activities carried out by their nation, whether the missions are led by government or private companies. American space operators have long faced uncertainty about which federal agency has responsibility for approving non-traditional space initiatives and ensuring compliance with the Outer Space Treaty. In some instances, this uncertainty has constrained capital formation, driving American companies overseas. With increased commercial activity in space, this uncertainty is becoming an even larger problem. Outdated and cumbersome regulations continue to hinder innovation by companies that focus on launch, remote sensing, and non-traditional space technologies. Those are some of the challenges we face, but there are solutions. Continued U.S. leadership in outer space requires us to maximize and integrate the strengths of all three groups of stakeholders, military, government research, and commercial. This will result in a new concept of national power in outer space. We must use the energy of a vibrant private sector and create laws and policies that bring all three communities together, 
working toward a common end, American leadership in space. The House Science, Space, and Technology Committee is contributing to this effort. Two of our bills this year establish the United States as the jurisdiction of choice for private space activities. The first bill, the American Space Commerce Free Enterprise Act, provides a legal and policy framework that simplifies the space-based remote sensing regulatory system, enhances compliance with international obligations, improves national security, and removes regulatory barriers facing innovative space operators. The need for this legislation became clear during the previous administration when serious uncertainty arose after U.S. space exploration companies sought payload approval from the Department of Transportation for non-traditional space activities. But the DOT payload approval process is only designed to prevent the launch of payloads that jeopardize American interest in safety. It does not provide for the authorization and supervision of in-space activities as required by the Outer Space Treaty. So the executive branch has been unable to assure the private sector that new and innovative space missions would be approved for launch. Another important aspect of the bill is updating space-based remote sensing regulations. Hundreds of private remote sensing satellites orbit the Earth today, and we all rely on these satellites for accurate mapping, enhanced agriculture, and improved weather forecast. But existing law governing the licensing of space-based remote sensing was enacted in 1992 at a time when there were no private remote sensing companies. The law put the burden on the applicant to justify its operations. This is stifling private innovation and putting U.S. industry at a disadvantage. Our bill fixes this broken system by providing a streamlined licensing process aimed towards approval, not denial. This legislation will spur investment and innovation, which will create high-paying jobs, high-value jobs across the country. It increases American competitiveness and attracts companies' talents and money that would otherwise go to other countries. The bill also consolidates regulatory authorities into one federal agency, the Secretary of Commerce's Office of Space Commerce. The result is a single decision point for the authorization of activities in outer space. In short, the American Space Commerce Free Enterprise Act ensures the U.S. and its workforce will benefit from the new space economy. The second Science Committee bill, the American Space Safe Management Act, establishes a space traffic management framework built on science and technology. Uh, it is also based upon space situational awareness and space traffic coordination. Today, there are 1,100 active satellites in orbit. In a few years, there will be tens of thousands. A variety of new spacecraft soon will go into operation. They could include private space stations, on-orbit repair and refueling satellites, and celestial resource prospectors. This act directs the administration to coordinate its federal research and development investments in space traffic management. It directs the administration to work collaboratively with the private sector and establishes a NASA Center of Excellence that will develop, lead, and promote research in space traffic management. This bill also creates a Civil Space Situational Awareness Program, SSA, within the Department of Commerce. Commerce will provide a basic level of SSA information and services free of charge to the public. While the Department of Defense retains the information gathering resources currently used to compile the catalog of space objects, Commerce will augment that with data from other sources, including the private sector and foreign partners. And the Act establishes a space traffic management framework. The framework consists of voluntary guidelines developed by the government standards developed by industry, and a pilot space traffic coordination program. The pilot program allows the government and stakeholders to experiment and develop best practices to manage space traffic. It is a common sense first step in what will be a long-term process of creating a comprehensive space traffic management framework. Both of these bills direct the Commerce, Department of Commerce to be responsible for carrying out the supervision of space activities. The reason for that is simple. Because of its long-standing mission and agency culture, the Commerce Department is best equipped 
to help entrepreneurs and innovators build companies and succeed in business. Many of the bill's goals have been included in President Trump's space policy directives. And Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross announced a major reorganization of his department that reflects our bill's provisions. To ensure success, Secretary Ross is putting people, money, and expertise into a new space policy advancing commercial enterprise, uh, acronym of course, SPACE, uh, administration and a restructured office of space commerce. We should thank the President, the Vice President, and Secretary Ross for carrying out this reorganization. The momentum is building for these bills and the last step before becoming law is approval by the U.S. Senate. We need champions there to get these bills through committee and onto the Senate floor. Far-sighted and determined policymakers and scientists led the charge for the first wave of space exploration. Now it is our responsibility to expand our leadership in space, working together with visionaries like Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, and Elon Musk. The history of space exploration will feature this bipartisan, bicameral bill as having invigorated the next space age and maintained America's leadership in space. America is the prominent actor on the global stage of outer space. We have the responsibility and the expertise to guide the world toward a peaceable, prosperous, and safe space environment. But we need to act and act now. Thank you all.